high stakes as, as a conflict could be. Well, so this morning, I think it was on MSNBC, one of the more prominent neocons, and I can't recall his name, dismissed out of hand any concern about the use of nuclear weapons. And the commentator on MSNBC impressed me because this man said, stop paying attention to what Putin, Putin said he may or may not do and forget that. That's not a threat. And the man said to him, well, thus far, Putin has done everything he said he would do. When everyone here in the United States, and as far as I could tell in Western Europe, said, oh, no, he'll never go in. The Russians will never go into Ukraine. That's too risky and so forth. Once again, no understanding that for the Russians, what happens in Ukraine is existential. Yes, what happens for us in Mexico is existential. Unfortunately, we're doing nothing about it. Our borders <laughs> are open. The drug cartels now control the borders. We don't. Millions of people are marching into this country. We don't know where they're from. Well, we know generally, but they're not coming with skills or abilities that we necessarily need. And more important, I don't see much evidence these people are remotely interested in becoming Americans. I mean, that used to be the principal motivation. If you go back uh, 100 years, everybody's trying to get here desperately to become an American. How often do you hear that? I never hear it at all. So, I, you know, the whole thing is, is on its head. And we're worried about what's happening in Ukraine. What we should be doing is worrying about how do we forge or craft a solution that both sides can live with. Let's go back to what Putin said at the beginning. See what he's still willing to do. Because at this point, remember, he's done a lot of damage to the Ukrainians. How, how much willingness is there to stick with those original objectives? Or is he going to demand more? But we've got to end this thing before it gets out of control. And as, as you move closer to the Polish border, as I'm, I'm afraid something like that is going to happen, the more likely you are to have that accident that brings everyone into, into a war that no one in their right mind wants. And I include, by the way, President Biden in that. I, I just don't think he knew what he was doing when he made his speech in Warsaw. It, he looks foolish and stupid. But I guess, again, what you're going to see is more and more Europeans say, well, we didn't sign on for a regime change war. Uh, we haven't signed on for a potential nuclear confrontation in Europe. I mean, the, I think Europeans, the, the support base that we're characterizing as uh, strong and unambiguously unified is nonsense. That's going to crumble. And the same thing is true when you look at the sanctions. Sanctions are another form of warfare. And that's why this ruble contract is a, a wonderful riposte, if you will, by the Russians. They're turning it right around. Because the Europeans can't go for a month or two months or three months right now without Russian petroleum products and energy. It's impossible. The Germans have said so. Others have said so. So they know if they do, uh, they're going to have hundreds of thousands of their citizens, if not millions, in the streets. They're going to have a 1789 experience. Okay. So the bottom line is, I think all of this is going to crumble, but this is kind of the the last gasp of the globalist elite, because if Russia is allowed to be successful in what it set out to do in Ukraine, it gets a neutral state, or you get a territorial arrangement with a neutral state that's different, then the, the message is clear and unambiguous to the world. The unipolar moment is over. The United States cannot bully everyone everywhere all the time. Russia is not Iraq. Yeah. And I think one of the things that the this is something I try to really uh, try to persuade people of is that I think there's this uh, unipolar moment or American dominance. America is number one. It kind of attitude in our culture has um, it's been so intertwined with the um, the American identity that I try to remind people that the, the unipolar moment has not been good for the average American. This has not helped you at all. It is, no. There, there's no evidence that there was any benefit to the world or to the average American person for the, in, in the idea that we run the world and we have global hegemony or whatever they want to call something that to me kind of looks a lot more like a world empire, but uh, okay. Um, what does this do? What does this do for the average American that's supposed to be uh, you know benefiting from this? And I, I think that, and one of the things to go back to, you know, you saying that there is this kind of encouraging sign that people are waking up to some degree, you know, Tucker Carlson is really the only guy on TV who's been talking about this and telling the truth, or at least parts of it. Um, and he's the number one show in cable news. And there is something, there is something to that, that the one guy kind of telling the truth, the people like the most. And that's that's all this is. I mean, look, 
whatever it is, there's the American people are just being lied to about what's going on. You know, the idea that we're we're supporting Ukraine because they're such a democracy. That's the we could, just because we love democracy so much, even though, you know, they overthrew a democratically elected government way back in 2014, even though they've banned uh, other political parties and imprisoned political opponents and absorbed, you know, news outlets into under the state apparatus that we're, this is still some thriving democracy. Oh, and by the way, don't focus on how the Donbass region and Crimea in 2015 voted to be ruled by Russia, not Ukraine. Don't don't worry about that. Democracy doesn't apply to that. And by the way, the people who love democracy so much and just have such bleeding hearts for the loss of life were happy to partner with the Saudis to conduct a war in Yemen. But we don't seem to have any concern about a war there where far more people um, have been dying for quite a bit longer in a much poorer country. You know, it's just there's just so much that if you just look at it objectively, the the official narrative collapses under the weight of even a little bit of truth, like just that little bit of truth right there. The official narrative collapses. So hopefully people like you keep getting out there and telling the American people the truth and they they wake up about some of this stuff. Well, I, I grew up in the 1960s while the Vietnam War was in full swing and there was a split in my family at the time. My mother was always insisting that we have to support the troops in Vietnam. And uh, she didn't like Lyndon Johnson. She didn't like what was going on, but she said, we, we have an obligation. We have to support this. We don't want to quote unquote lose. Well, her father had served in the first world war. And he said, well, if you're concerned about the troops, bring them home. Because his conclusion at the end of World War I was that we had involved ourselves in a war where we should never have fought, that we caused Western civilization to fragment and fall apart. And then subsequently, we installed Bolshevism in Russia and helped bring National Socialism to power in Germany. And had we stayed out, we might have avoided those things. Well, that's kind of that's kind of the way I look at what's happening right now in Eastern Europe. There are all sorts of really bad potential outcomes from this. But I think Americans are now finally beginning to look at, at the whole business and be skeptical. Wherever we were told in Vietnam, victory or defeat in Vietnam will tell whether or not the Western world and the free world prevails in its struggle with communism. Didn't make any difference at all. Never did. It was irrelevant. And that's not to say that anyone who dies anywhere is irrelevant. But that doesn't necessarily justify our intervention. And again, why can't we go back to the kind of country that we were 100 years ago, which in most cases was interested in intervening to end conflicts, not with military power, but to offer its services as an objective partner, as someone who could bring two sides together and avoid a larger, more destructive conflict? We could do that. We have a lot of power still. We still have a great economy in many respects. We're destroying it with our debt finance consumption and shipping our jobs overseas. We know that. But the point is we could do a lot of good as opposed to all of the disastrous wrongs that we've been engaged in. But as you know, if you say those things, you're a traitor, you're a Putin agent, you're an enemy of everything good, and that's the game that's played in Washington. Yeah. I, I don't think it, it resonates very strongly outside the Beltway, 